So who better to start us off on our journey into the future uh, but Lord Rees, who will be speaking on understanding and changing the world beyond 2050. Uh, Lord Rees is Master of Trinity College here. He's Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics. He's President of the Royal Society and a crossbench member of the House of Lords. He's had an enormous influence on UK and international science, and he's a prolific author. And please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Martin Rees to the podium. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take as my text the famous closing words of The Origin of Species. I'm myself an astronomer, and astronomers aim to probe back before Darwin's simple beginning, to set our solar system in a cosmic context to understand how it and the atoms it's made of came into existence. For astronomers, an iconic figure ranking with Darwin is Isaac Newton, another great Cambridge alumnus. But I'm delighted that it's Darwin and not Newton whom we're celebrating. Newton might have beaten Darwin on an IQ test, but he was a deeply unattractive character. <laughs> uh, solitary and obsessive when young, vindictive and vain in his later years. But he was, of course, the first to understand how the planets go cycling on in their orbits. And he must have thought about space travel. So I'm having some problems with my... Right, yes. This picture from the English edition of his Principia is still the neatest way to explain orbital flight. He calculated that the cannonball would need to go at 18,000 miles an hour in order to go in a trajectory that led to an orbit. And the first object actually to reach orbit was, of course, Sputnik, which went up in 1957. Just 12 years later, 40 years ago, Neil Armstrong's One Small Step gave us an image that's imprinted on the memories of all of us who are now middle-aged. But another image from that era has become just as iconic. The photo taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts portraying the delicate biosphere of our Earth contrasting with the sterile moonscape in the foreground. And let me offer a cosmic vignette, as it were, inspired by this image. Suppose some alien species had been watching our planet for its entire history. What would they have seen? Over nearly all that time, 45 million centuries, change was very gradual. Continents drifted, the ice cover waxed and waned, species emerged, evolved, and became extinct. But then suddenly, the pace of change accelerated as humans came on the scene and grew in numbers and impact. Agriculture transformed vegetation and forests. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere began to rise due to burning of fossil fuels. And something else unprecedented happened. Small projectiles launched from the planet's surface escaped the biosphere completely. Some went into orbit around the Earth, some journeyed to the moon and beyond. Well, could the hypothetical aliens have predicted this runaway spasm occupying less than a millionth of the elapsed time? And if they continued to keep watch, what might they witness in this century? What does the future hold? One trend we can predict with confidence is that by mid-century, the will, barring global catastrophe, be more people on the world than today. 50 years ago, the world population was below 3 billion. It's more than doubled since then to 6.7 billion today. And it's projected to reach 9 billion by 2050. By then, it'll be in Asia, not Europe nor the US, where the world's physical and intellectual capital are concentrated. In most countries, Fertility has fallen below replacement level. And we know the social trends that lead to this demographic transition. 
declining infant mortality, availability of contraceptive advice, women's education, and so forth. And if the tr transition quickly extended to all countries, then the global population could gradually decline after 2050, a development that would surely be benign. But the demographic transition hasn't occurred in Africa, where there could be a billion more people in 2050 than there are today. In 1950, Europe had three times Africa's population. In 2050, Africa will have three times Europe's population. And it's there that Paul Collier's bottom billion are increasingly concentrated, trapped in poverty. Over 200 years ago, Malthus famously argued that populations would rise until limited by food shortages. His gloomy prognosis has been forestalled by advancing technology, the Green Revolution, and so forth. But he could be tragically vindicated in Africa. A second Green Revolution may be needed to forestall tragedy. And massive migration from Africa into Europe, motivated by desperation, is a real threat. The challenge of feeding Earth's growing population is aggravated by climate change. And a second firm prediction about 2050 is that the world will then be warmer than today. The consequent shifts in weather patterns and rising sea levels impact most grievously on those least able to adapt and on countries that themselves contributed minimally to global CO2 emissions. What should make us especially anxious is the significant probability of triggering a grave and irreversible global trend. Rising sea levels due to the melting of Greenland's ice cap, the runaway release of methane in the tundra, and so forth. I'll say no more on climate science, since Brian Hoskins is a world expert, and he's speaking next. The science is intricate, but it's a doddle compared to the politics and economics for two reasons. Unlike most familiar pollution, the impact of CO2 isn't local. Emissions from the UK and from Australia have the same global effect. Any effective polluter pays principle must therefore be international. And the second feature of global warming is the time lag. The effects of enhanced CO2 take decades to manifest themselves fully. History will surely judge us harshly if we discount too heavily what might happen when our grandchildren grow old. But sociobiologists might tell us that this cerebral reaction is contrary to the deeply ingrained focus on those close to us which evolution has selected for. The target espoused by the G8 plus five nations is to reduce global emissions to half the 1990 level. This target corresponds to two tons of CO2 per person per year on the planet. For comparison, the current American level is 20, the current European level is 10, the Chinese level is 5.5, and the Indian 1.5. So it's urgent to develop clean, more efficient technology soon enough that Asian per capita emissions never need rise to ours, and ours go down to converge towards theirs. Some pessimists argue that the international community should, as a fallback, contemplate a plan B, being fatalistic about the rise in CO2, but intervening to combat its warming effects by, for instance, putting iron filings in the atmosphere, aerosols in the, sorry, iron filings in the ocean, or aerosols in the atmosphere, or even vast sunshades in space. Such geoengineering, even if feasible, wouldn't solve climate change. It would at best buy time and might have adverse unintended consequences. However, whether we like it or not, we humans are willy-nilly remaking the biosphere. Indeed, we're severely ravaging it already by changes in land use and deforestation that are far too fast for species to adapt to. There have been five great extinctions in the past. We are causing a sixth. The extinction rate is a thousand times higher than normal and increasing. And to quote Bob May, we are destroying the book of life before we've read it. Biodiversity manifested in forests, 
coral reefs, and all Earth's other ecosystems, is often proclaimed as a crucial component of human well-being and economic growth. It manifestly is. We're clearly harmed if fish stocks dwindle to extinction, and massive destructions of rainforests would accelerate global warming. And there are plants whose gene pool might be useful to us. But for environmentalists, these instrumental and anthropocentric arguments aren't the only compelling ones. For them, preserving the richness of our biosphere has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us as humans. Some years ago, I wrote a book which I entitled Our Final Century? The publishers took away the question mark. <laughs> and the American publishers retitled the book as Our Final Hour. <laughs> Americans want instant gratification and perhaps the reverse too. The book addressed the issues I've just discussed and some others I'll briefly mention. Most of us have a confused attitude to risk. We fret about traces of carcinogens in food, a one in a million chance of being killed in a train crash, and so forth. But we're in denial about others that should loom much larger. For instance, infectious diseases are a resurgent hazard. A global pandemic could kill tens of millions and cost many trillions of dollars. If we apply to pandemics the same prudent analysis that leads us to buy insurance, multiplying probability by consequence, we'd surely conclude that measures to alleviate this kind of extreme event need higher priority. Effective prevention and early warning has to be a fully international endeavor. Whether or not a pandemic gets global grip may depend on how quickly a Vietnamese poultry farmer can diagnose or report any strange sickness. In the coming decades, there could be a kind of arms race between ever improving preventative measures and the growing virulence of the pathogens that could plague us, the latter augmented perhaps by the risks of bio-error or bioterror. And the spread of epidemics is aggravated by rapid air travel, plus the huge concentration of people in megacities with fragile infrastructure. And the nature of risk has changed. If a boiler explodes, it's horrible, but there's an upper limit to just how horrible. But in our interconnected world, there are new risks whose consequences could be so devastating and so dispersed that even a tiny probability is disquieting. We're all precariously dependent on elaborate networks, electricity grids, air traffic control, the internet, just-in-time delivery, and so forth. And it's crucial to optimize the resilience of all these systems. In a future era of vast individual empowerment, by bio, cyber, and nanotechnology, even one malign act could be too many. And the global village will have its village idiots. We're kidding ourselves if we think that technical expertise is always allied with balanced rationality. It can be combined with fanaticism, not just the traditional fundamentalism we're so mindful of today, but new age irrationalities. I'm thinking of the Raelians, extreme echo freaks, violent animal rights campaigner, and people with those mindsets. Let me now inject some optimism, <laughs> some good news. Obviously, healthcare is improving at a global level. Indeed, there's been a welcome rebalancing of effort. Traditionally, the focus was on diseases of the rich, cardiovascular diseases and cancer. But tropical diseases are now producing more receiving more attention, and that's thanks substantially to the uh, impetus of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And mindful of where Bill Gates got his money, let's recall that the silicon chip was perhaps the most transformative single invention of the last century. It's allowed miniaturization, spawned mobile reach of mobile phones and internet, promoting economic growth while being sparing of energy and resources. Indeed, these advances amaze us by their rapidity. iPhones would have seemed magic 30 years ago. NASA, at the time of the Apollo program, had less computer power than in an iPhone, even than in a washing machine today. If advances continue at the same pace, computers will, by 2050, 
achieve human capabilities. Of course, in some respects, they already have. The most basic pocket calculator can hugely surpass us as arithmetic. IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. But not even the most advanced robots can recognize and handle the pieces on a real chessboard as adeptly as a five-year-old child. There's a long way to go before interactive, human-level robotic intelligence is achieved. But when that does happen, everyone's lifestyle and work pattern will surely be transformed. For scientists, incidentally, some kind of mental pr prosthetics may become essential. A unified theory of physics or a theory of consciousness might be beyond the power of unaided human brains, just as surely as quantum mechanics would flummox a chimpanzee. Another speculation, a real wild card in population projections, is that the human lifespan could be greatly extended. Cynthia Kenyon may address this later. Indeed, some Americans, worried that they'll die before this nirvana is reached, bequeath their bodies to be frozen on their death. If they can't afford the whole body, they want their head frozen. <laughs> they hope that some future generations will resurrect them or download their brains into a computer. Well, for my part, I'd sooner end my days in an English churchyard rather than the Californian refrigerator. But flaky futurologists aren't always wrong. I tell students they derive more stimulus from first-rate science fiction than from second-rate science. And we should keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to wacky-seeming concepts. Before this century's end, novel mind-enhancing drugs, genetics, and cyborg techniques may start to alter human beings themselves. Evolution will proceed not just at the pace of Darwinian selection, but on a much shorter time scale of technological change. The post-human era may beckon sooner than we think. But one surely on firm grounds in one further forecast. There'll be an ever-widening gulf between what science enables us to do and what applications it's prudent or ethical actually to do more doors that science could open, but which are best kept closed. Decisions on science's application, whether to energy, GM technology, stem cells, mind-enhancing drugs, or whatever, must be based on the best scientific advice. But strategic, economic, social, and ethical ramifications enter as well. And here, scientists have no special credentials. That's why science education should be universal. Science is changing the world in this century. The response to the problems it raises should not be a go slow on science, but faster and redirected research. But as well as changing the world, science is part of our culture. Indeed, it's the one truly global culture, common to all faiths and all nations. It's a cultural deprivation not to be aware of how some still mysterious event nearly 14 billion years ago, led to the emergence of atoms, galaxies, stars, and planets, and how here on Earth life began, and Darwinian selection led to creatures able to ponder their origin. And I want to spend my last 10 minutes pondering what might lie beyond our Earth. Since Apollo, manned spaceflight has stagnated. Robotic probes have, however, gone to most of the planets of our solar system, beaming back pictures of varied and distinctive worlds. Here are some of them. Here are three pictures of the surface of Mars. Here's Jupiter with its four big moons. Europa is especially interesting. There it is. There, in close-up, one sees the ice over a frozen ocean. And a European robotic probe landed on Titan, Saturn's giant moon, a couple of years ago. The river channels 
uh, rivers of liquid methane. The lake is a methane lake. The temperature is minus 180 degrees centigrade. Well, within the next 50 years, robotic probes will have explored in detail all the bodies of the solar system. Will they find signs of life? Evidence for even the most primitive life, provided especially that we could show it had an independent origin, would be a momentous discovery. And these are the places where we might look. But the prospects of finding a propitious habitat are surely hugely enlarged if we widen our gaze beyond the solar system to other stars far beyond the reach of any probe we can now conceive. We've learned enough about the stars to understand them. Stars and atoms are much simpler than the simplest biological organism, like an insect. We see places where new stars are still forming today, the Eagle Nebula, and we see stars dying. Some elegantly, like the sun will in six billion years, some more violently in supernova explosions. Stars are fueled by nuclear fusion. They forge from pristine hydrogen all the elements of the periodic table, and they fling the debris back into space in explosions like that. Galaxies like ours, or like Andromeda shown there, are really like ecological systems where gas is being recycled. And our entire galaxy is really part of our environment in an intimate sense. Because to understand ourselves, we must understand the atoms we're made of, but we must also understand the stars far away in our Milky Way that made those atoms. In this cosmic or galactic perspective, how unusual is our Earth? We've recently learned something that makes the night sky much more interesting. The stars aren't just twinkling points of light. Many are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is. I'm trying to get the next. Yeah, oh, there we are, yes. Uh, sorry, I have to go back one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Planets can't be directly seen around other stars, uh, but many have been inferred indirectly. There are two ways of inferring them. One is indicated here, that if a planet orbiting a star, then both actually orbit around a common center of mass, and you can detect the little wobble in the motion of the star. Another way is to watch a star very carefully and detect the slight dimming if a planet moves across in front of it and blocks out some of its light. By techniques like this, hundreds of extrasolar planets have already been inferred. But these are mainly giant planets, objects the size of Jupiter and Saturn, the giants of our solar system. In seeking evidence for cosmic life, we'd be especially interested in possible twins of our Earth, planets the same size as ours, orbiting other sun-like stars, on orbits with temperatures such that water neither boils nor stays frozen and actually imaging Earth-like planets, rather than just detecting their shadow moving across a star, is a task for the future. To understand this challenge, suppose an alien astronomer with a powerful telescope was looking at our solar system from, say, 30 light years away, the distance of a nearby star. The sun would look like an ordinary star, and our planet would seem in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, a pale blue dot, very close to its star, our sun, that outshines it by many billions, a firefly next to a searchlight. But if the aliens watched our Earth, they could learn quite a bit. The shade of blue will be slightly different, depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So the aliens could infer that there were continents, the length of the day, the seasons, and the climate. By analyzing the faint reflected light, they could infer that we had a biosphere. Within 
20 years, instruments like this array in space or this huge projected telescope on the ground will, I fully expect, allow us to detect huge numbers of planets the same size as our Earth orbiting other sun-like stars and draw the kind of inferences I just indicated. But will there be life on them? We still know too little about how life began here on Earth to be able to say whether alien life is likely or unlikely. Even if simple life is common, it's of course a separate question whether it's likely to evolve into anything we might recognize as intelligent. Indeed, I gather that among evolutionists, there's still debate about what would happen if evolution were re-ran on the Earth. Would we end up with uh, an intelligent species? Well, as you know, there are ongoing privately funded searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, the so-called SETI program. And perhaps this program will one day detect a signal that's clearly artificial. Even if it's very boring, a list of prime numbers of the or the digits of pi, it would carry the momentous message that concepts of logic and physics, if not consciousness, aren't limited to the hardware in human skulls. But if we did detect anything like that, then there would, I suppose, be some shared culture. Even if the aliens were on planet Zog and had seven tentacles, they'd be made of the same kind of atoms as us. They'd gaze out if they had eyes at the same cosmos. They'd trace their origins back to the same Big Bang. But of course, any aliens would be at the very least tens of light years away. So if we get a signal, there's time to send a measured response. No scope for snappy repartee. Well, we may learn in the coming decades not only more about how life began on the Earth, but more importantly, whether biological evolution is unique to our home planet or whether Darwin's writ runs in the wider universe. If advanced life is rare, if SETI searches are destined to fail, we might feel lonely. But were that the outcome, we would get a boost to our cosmic self-esteem. Because tiny though our Earth is, it could still be special, even in the context of our galaxy. Moreover, this outcome, finding ourselves alone, wouldn't mean that life would forever be a trivial afterthought in an overwhelmingly sterile cosmos. And that's because of another realization which astronomers can offer to evolutionists. And that's the awareness of an immense future. The stupendous time spans of the evolutionary past are now, of course, part of common understanding outside creationist circles. But most people, while accepting that, still somehow think we humans are towards the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that hardly seems credible to me as an astronomer. This time-lapse cartoon indicates our sun's light cycle, starting from an interstellar cloud and ending up flaring up as a red giant. Our sun formed four and a half billion years ago, but it's got six billion years before the fuel runs out. It then flares up, engulfing the inner planets and vaporizing whatever remains on Earth. And the expanding universe will continue much longer, perhaps forever, destined to become ever colder, ever emptier. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. Any creature witnessing the sun's demise six billion years hence, here on Earth or far beyond, won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug. 
This quote reminds us that Darwin himself realized this, that we are not the culmination. And post-human evolution, here on Earth and far beyond, could be as prolonged as the Darwinian evolution that's led to us and even more wonderful. However, my concluding message is this. Even in this concertinaed timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, the present century may be a defining moment. It's the first in our planet's history when one species, ours, has Earth's future in its hands and could not only jeopardize itself, but foreclose life's immense potential. So this pale blue dot in the cosmos is a special place, and we are its stewards at a pivotal era. Thank you very much.